the one and only Zoroastrian college in the world, was founded with the blessings and under the spiritual guidance of Shah Behram Varzavan Sahib and the late Ustad Behram Shah Nauroji Shroff. Dame Dr. Professor Meher Master Moose and her late distinguished parents, Kaikashru Ardeshar Master QC, Barrister, and Mrs. Amy Kaikashru Master, started this global educational platform by flagging off the first series of lectures in 1986. Since then, over 400 persons from over 20 countries have availed of its research facilities and benefits to obtain master's and doctorate degrees. The keynote speaker today, Dr. Davish Jain, completed his MPhil, PhD, DSc and DLIT, all postgraduate degrees through the Zoroastrian College, before going on in his distinguished career to become founder chancellor of Prestige University. Dr. Davish Jain is the chairman, Prestige University Education Foundation, Chancellor, Prestige University, Indoor, the President, Prestige Group of Industries Chairman, the Soya Bean Processors Association of India, the ex-national president, the Center for Education, Growth and Research, New Delhi. Dr. Davish Jain, President of the Prestige Group of Industries, is a dynamic and forward-looking industrialist who has inherited the vision and foresight of his illustrious father, Dr. Naim Nath Jain, Padma Shri Awardee. He is also the recipient of the award Chairman of the Year 2023 Education during Leaders Awards 2023 Conference with partners ET Now Swadesh, the CEO magazine, the CEO Today, and has won the title Visionary Educationist of Central India by News 18 MPCG. This award was conferred upon him by the Minister of Higher Education of Madhya Pradesh, the Honorable and a great thinker, an educationist par excellence and a social motivator, Dr. Darvish Jain is also the Chairman of the Prestige Education Foundation and Chancellor of the recently founded 5000 crore Prestige University in Madhya Pradesh. Over to Dr. Jain. Respected dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and fellow advocates for gender equality. It is indeed an honor to address this esteemed gathering at the 68th session of Commission on Status of Women. Our theme, accelerating the achievements of gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls resonates deeply with the global commitment to create a more just and equitable world. Before I begin, I would like to quote Swami Vivekanand, who once said, the best thermometer to the progress of a nation is the treatment of its women. There is no chance for the welfare of the world unless the condition of women is improved. I believe that his quote holds relevance not only for today, but for every era. The status of women has been a grave topic for many years in the past. It encompasses various important issues of girl and women education, maternal health, economic empowerment of females, and the role of women in family, community, politics, and more. Let's try to see what is the real picture. Throughout the world, various social norms in some form or another deny women their right to education, health services, economic opportunities, and political participation. This gender inequality hinders the progress of the environmental sustainability, financial stability, global health, and human rights, and is the primary cause of hunger and poverty. According to a study, Conducted by the United Nations, women constitute more than two-thirds of the world's illiterate population. Another piece of research shows that 80% of the world's refugees are women. Also, women only own 1% of the world's resources and earn a small part of one-tenth of the world's income. The place of women in society is a critical factor in judging the success of any civilization. Talking about India's culture, 
Manu, the great lawgiver, said, Where women are honored, there resides the gods. The Constitution of India clearly states that women have equal rights with men and are legal citizens of the country. Despite this, a majority of them suffer from poor health and malnutrition. If the women even think of themselves first in any manner, maybe academically or financially, society makes them feel guilty about it. Earlier, the majority of women were uneducated. Now many of them have an education, but most of it is not adequate. We have not made much difference where have we? As far as India is concerned, more than half of our country's population resides in villages. The majority of these women living in villages do not avail medical care during health problems or pregnancy because they have been led to believe that this is temporary condition not requiring any medical treatment. The dowry custom, which is fortunately coming to an end now, was the conventional thinking and therefore girl child was thought to be a burden. No good can come out of a girl being born. Even though our constitution firmly guarantees for free primary schooling to everyone up to 14 years of age, the only 39% of females in India attend primary schools. In the past four decades, women's status in Western countries has undergone dramatic and remarkable changes. Since the days of World War II, the changes have occurred both at home and in the workplace. Having a look at the Indian take, the role of women in shaping modern India has been phenomenal. The Indian subcontinent, it has emerged as a powerful nation since women began playing notable roles in the development of this land, its culture and economy. The tradition in the status of women in India from the past to the present is worth appreciating. Women are now considered to be the forces that develop a country. They are capable of striking a perfect balance between their household and professional lives. The future of Indian women is bright and flourishing. The society is opening all the doors for them to progress and succeed, realizing their true potential. They are conquering every field, be it science, technology, research, defense, political space, literature, or the arts. Indian women have adorned high offices and respectable posts like that of the, the current president of India, Her Excellency Madam Draupadi Murmu, the first tribal woman holding the highest constitutional position in India, India's finance minister, Honorable Madam Nirmala Sitaraman, who through her immense economic wisdom has proved that Indian women can not only manage homes but also the finances of a huge country like India. Former President Mrs. Pratibha Patil, the Prime Minister Mrs. Indira Gandhi, current Speaker of Lok Sabha Mrs. Meera Kumar, Mrs. Samitra Mahajan, first women IAS Isha Basanti Joshi, the first women IAS Kiran Bedi and the list long of many others. The future of women is full of success in every field they pursue. They have numerous golden opportunities starting from the school level to professional careers. Women are being boosted to do better in the areas of interest by their family members, especially after their marriage. There is a concerted effort, again, by the men to bring parity between genders. Let us begin to acknowledging the progress made globally in the recent past, India's collective and unwavering dedication to championing gender equality and empowering all women and girls has now secured a firm place within the G20 New Delhi Leaders Declaration 2023. In a historic achievement for gender and women-led development, the G20 New Delhi Leaders Declaration 2023 focuses on enhancing economic and social empowerment, bridging the gender digital divide, driving gender inclusive climate action, and securing women food security, nutrition, and well-being. Most importantly, the leaders of the G20 agreed to the creation of a working group on the empowerment of women to support the G20 Women's Ministerial, which will convene its first meeting during the Brazilian G20 presidency. 
the focus has shifted from women's development to women led development emphasizing economic and social empowerment bridging the gender digital divide driving gender inclusive climate action and securing women's food security nutrition and well being recently in the 54th annual meeting of the world's economic summit held at davos in january this year india successfully set up a global alliance for global good gender equality and and equity to push empowerment and gender equality political representation let's talk about by reserving one third of the parliamentary seats for women india shattered gender barriers and promoted a more inclusive and equitable democracy this bold move signifies a giant leap forward achieving gender parity and fostering women's leadership in decision making process after centuries of injustice a woman can be her true self gender stereotypes no longer have a place in this age of individuality however challenges persist i would like to now talk about education progress with room for growth while the primary education gender gap has closed globally disparities persist in secondary and higher education particularly with fields like stem in india the female literacy rate has risen to 77.7% yet lags behind the male rate of 87.7% initiatives like the right to education act in india strive to bridge this gap but ingrained social norms and limited access to quality education in rural areas remain hurdles so pol- about the political participation india figures 15.3% reflects the stark reality of limited opportunities for women in political leadership while quotas and reserved seats in local bodies like panchayats have shown some success dismantling deeply entrenched patriarchal structures and promising promoting women's political aspirations within their communities is crucial for systematic change the scenario of labor force in is equally important despite reaching 49.6% globally women labor force participation faces significant challenges the gender pay gap averaging 23% worldwide translates to lost wages and economic disadvantages for women in india the rate of 23% highlights the need for targeted interventions like equal pay legislation and dismantling the discriminatory hiring practices addressing these issues require comprehensive reforms along with promoting skill development and encouraging and entrepreneurship among women healthcare let's now talk about which is a matter of life and equity while maternal mortality rates have declined globally access to quality healthcare remains unequal india's rate of 178 deaths per 100000 live births stands in stark contrast to developed nations investing in robust healthcare infrastructure increasing female healthcare provider and tackling issues like malnutrition and early marriage are crucial steps towards ensuring the health and well-being of women and girls soybean offers a powerhouse of nutrients crucial for women health including protein fiber and essential vitamins and minerals they play a vital role in promoting health for heart by lowering cholesterol levels and reducing the risk of heart disease particularly significant for women phytoestrogens found in soybeans provide relief for menopausal possible symptoms and contribute to the bone health combating conditions like osteoporosis additionally soybeans may help lower the risk of breast cancer their low saturated fat content adds in weight management by promoting satiety i would like to talk about some eight of our initiatives by the prestige group of institutions the prestige group of institutions in its commitment to the gender equality and women empowerment has launched several initiatives to foster a more inclusive society recognizing that education is the cornerstone of empowerment the prestige group has implemented progress to provide quality education to girls especially in stem fields in conclusion let us draw inspiration from the words of Malala Yousafzai we cannot all succeed when half of our us are held back 
Together, let us accelerate gender equality, empower women, and create a world where every girl can dream without limits. Thank you, and may you, our collective efforts lead to a brighter, more equitable future for all. Jai Hind. Namaskar. Dr. Sayali Sachin Vaidya has done a graduation with a BA in psychology and completed her marriage counseling, six month certificate course, and post graduation diploma in counseling psychology from the Baya Karve. Her infill degree in marriage counseling and PhD degrees in LGBTQ community counseling were through the OIUCM, Shabai Ramsa, Barzavan Shah College, Zoroastrian College. She practices REBT and CBT therapy. She has also done Bach therapy remedy from Vital Vibes Mind Development Institute. Dr. Vaidya has completed her handwriting analysis course from the Durba Education Training Center Institute. She has completed signature analysis graphology from the Dhruva Education Training Center Institute as well. Having participated in parent counseling workshops from the Vitamin Wellness Center and the De-Addiction Counseling and Management on how to talk and explore sexual issues in counseling sessions and marriage and couple therapy from the SF Positive Mental Health Institute, Pune. She received a special speaker's award for her doctorate degree from the Zoroastrian College. Dr. Vaidya is practicing since the last five years in marital issues. Over to Dr. Sayali Sachin Vaidya. Hello, good morning. I'm Dr. Sayali Sachin Vaidya. I obtained my doctorate from OIUCM through Shah Behram Bagh Society, Zoroastrian College. I have also done my bachelor's in psychology from followed by post graduation diploma in marriage counseling. I pursue counseling courses with psychology as a base subject, including graphology and flower remedy based medicines with Dr. Bach and an MPhil in marriage counseling from OIUCM through Shah Behram Bagh Society, Zoroastrian College. I decided to pursue my doctorate in an altogether different subject. Since childhood, my interest in understanding the transgender community grew from observing the varied emotions and reactions of people towards the transgender community. People's facial expressions showed a range of emotions from disdain to fear, rage and surprises. This sparked my curiosity, leading me to study and research extensively in the field of transgender issues. For this, I delved into literature had direct interaction with transgender individuals, including couples and engaged in face-to-face -face interview. My experience gave me the confidence to address a variety of problems faced by the transgender community. Notably, the issue of public restrooms become a significant concern and I pondered on why such a basic need raises such complex problems. Through my studies and interaction, I discovered that these problems arise from a lack of acceptance and understanding. Transgender individuals like any other community are a part of society and accepting this fact is crucial. The journey of self-acceptance is difficult and society's acceptance is equally challenging. That said, self-acceptance is the first important and crucial step towards this transformation change. And then comes recognizing everyone's responsibility in this process. I, I urge everyone to question their biases and preju prejudice and acknowledge that transgender 
individuals are just and natural as anyone else. By accepting and embracing diversity, we can create a more inclusive and compassionate society. For the transgender community as such, when these differences are pursued by the family as unique, it becomes difficult for them. After that, even they understand such an individual, this struggle further intensifies, causing a turmoil in the minds of transgender. Firstly, not being accepted by the family is the reason these people feel isolated. They try hard to explain to their parents and siblings, but it doesn't always work. Parents, siblings and the other relatives subject them to various types of discrimination, sometimes even for mental illness. As everyone in society does, they are expelled from a family for being different and then their struggle begins. Even then, society doesn't accept them. After this, they find support in their own community, where they are accepted with joy. However, constant conflicts arise for them in the pursuit of natural desire. They are often compelled to beg due to desperation or just to survive for their livelihood. Economically dependent on others, they had to rely on others for their survival. Many people lose hope and resort of different addictions for solace seeking refuse in various habits. They become addicted and mentally disturbed by any mental illnesses or physically ailment. They do not go to doctors or hospitals even if they are available. Now some improvements are being made for them by establishing separate classes in hospitals for them. They have the right to vote and they are allowed to marry with a partner of their choice. For every small matter, they have rights but they have to fight for those. They have to fight for their rights even to get married. Now, let me come to our role in acceptance of transgender in this society. A sense of responsibility is required for every small thing. As responsible citizens, it is our moral responsibility to accept this community. It starts with accepting it ourselves. And for that, a little practice is required. Understanding the LGBTQ plus community, that is the community based on sexual orientation is very important. Psychology based on these principles allowed us to spread awareness in society. With its basis, we can actively contribute to Propagation of understanding in society, it is very progressive and with its foundation, we can practice and spread awareness in society. Psychiatrists, psychologists and counsellors need to first understand now there is the need to improve an education. After that, the second aspect is to create awareness among these people through various programs, including social, school, colleges, governments, offices and private sectors. Different groups needs to be formed by organized workshops and their representatives should be trained to provide education to these people. Those who are educated needed to provide training to their respective small groups, for example, in schools and colleges. Counselors need to conduct workshops for students age 15-16 on topics related to LGBTQ plus community. 
After such trainings, small workshops can be conducted in clinics associated with small or large hospitals. Government offices and private sectors organizations should also conduct workshops in a similar manner. Training should be provided free of cost where possible and reasonable fees may be charged wherever not possible. Counseling seems to me to be a constant conversation about various things and I believe that counseling sessions should be conducted in the friendly and simple language. This can include spreading awareness about an LGBTQ plus community through systematic methods. I have had meeting with various transgender individuals and one transgender woman provided me with an excellent example. Even through my body appears to be a male, the feelings associated with my soul are of a woman. After that, the body is no longer present, but the soul remains. This understanding makes me realize that from a mental perspective, there is no contradiction between being a woman or a man. Nature has given an, us the label of human being at birth. Whether we are called a woman or a man, these are all labels created by your human being. This discrimination is not created by nature. Physically, I may appear as a male, but my soul is a woman. She beautifully explained that this example is very simple way, making it easy for people to understand. In a layman terms, simply put, accepting someone's psychologically as a woman and physically as a male is not against nature. For example, there is an object like vegetable basket that is meant to hold vegetable intact in the refrigerator. It is not a jewelry box in which we kept ornaments or jewel jewelry to store that box in a refrigerator. So, my physical body as I can uh, refrigerate whereas my soul is like a jewelry box which when kept in the refrigerator started getting restless. Hence, we may say the nature has sent this soul in the wrong box. The beginning has been made by forming various groups and by organizing large scale awareness workshop during these workshops, small scale therapies from psychology such as CBT, REBT, etc. have been utilized. Using these psychological therapies, we can create awareness about this subject. I thank the organizers of this parallel event for giving me an opportunity to present my thoughts here. I also thank you for your time. Dr. Professor Meher Master Moose is a jurist and educationist, the founder president of three societies, the Mas Diasni Monastery, Medicina Alternativa Society, the Zoroastrian College, and the All India Shah Behram Bagh Society for Scientific and Educational Research, an NGO in special consultative status with the United Nations ECOSOC. Since the past 40 years, Dr. Meher Master Moose is a speaker at international interfaith conferences, including the United Nations Religious Leaders Summit in the year 2000, the Parliament of World Religions, the Temple of Understanding, and the United Religions Initiative, the Global Conference in Brazil, 2002, amongst others. She is the authoress of 23 books on law, Medicina Alterniva, and Zoroastrian religion, Il Mekshnu. Over to Dr. Meher Mastemus. <laughs>
Namaste, Atash, Hasdam Rao, Pudam, Mazishta, Yazata, Ashim, Bohu, Vaishti, Masti, Ushta, Asti, Ushta, Mai, Yatashai, Vaishti, Ashim. May the blessings of Park Dada Aura all the Amesha Spenta, all the Yazata, all the Farukshi Faroha, the Minu, Dai, Ratu, Vakshure, Vakshuran, Ramsko, Ashos, Pichaman, Zatushta, Paigamba Sahib, Shah Varamba Zavan Sahib, the Prince of Peace of the Aquarian Age, all the blessings of the good and holy departed souls of Ustad Sahib, Varamsha, Naroji, Shraf, and my late father and mother, Kekushu Adesha Master, and Amy Kekushu Master, the founders of the Zoroastrian College. Late Veramsha Pithamala and Ganesha, Vajan Daruwala, Homer Srivanya, and so many other great and good holy departed souls who, in the course of their lifetimes on planet Earth, have lent a helping hand for the establishment and continuation of the one and only Zoroastrian college in the world. May their souls be happy in the spiritual realms and shower their blessings on all of us here on planet Earth, and especially the great and good persons in the United Nations who are the organizers of the CSW 68 program. May their blessings continue long to bring about peace, joy, and happiness on this planet Earth and bring about the fulfillment of the goals of the CSW, the sustainable infrastructure to advance gender equality, which is what Zoroastrian College is doing for the last four decades. May these beautiful flowers, their fragrance and their colors, give peace and joy to all the people in the world, all those who are participating in this program, and those who are in many, many countries worldwide who have the happiness and joy to evolve spiritually and become one with the creator of the universe to fulfill the purpose of their soul taking birth on planet Earth. We are happy to say that this is the fourth time that the RNGO the All India Shah Berambak Society for Scientific and Educational Research is holding this parallel event at the CSW program in the month of March. What is the Zoroastrian College for? It is for spreading Manashni, Gavashni, and Kunashni, spreading spiritual evolution to enable each person to attain the goal of life on earth, of each soul becoming one with the universal white light of Aura Mazda, Almighty God, creator of the universe of light, energy, and matter. This is a spiritual white light center. All are welcome to it from everywhere, all four corners of the world. P stands for preparation of people on earth for the advent of Shah Baramba, Zaman Sahib, the Rhino the Sahib of the Aquarian Age, through whose guidance this work is going on through the United Nations and countries of the world and their governments and peoples, that the earth will become a happy, joyous and safe place for people and all creatures to live in. R for research and study of the ancient esoteric wisdom for the universal benefit of humanity. That is what the sustainable goals are all about of the United Nations, and especially the sustainable infrastructure to advance gender equality, which is what our college is doing to promote and prepare, create a global platform for scientific research to be presented for the benefit of humanity worldwide. E stands for expansion of consciousness and awareness of the divine universal natural laws of the wisdom of the Ilmik Shnum knowledge, which is contained in the ancient Mazdiasi, Zathrish, and Daina Avastan literature. A for achievement in academic endeavors and progress 
achievement of the sustainable development goals of the United Nations and D, development of each individual for attaining harmony of body, mind and soul. In, I is for inculcating righteousness and obedience of cosmic laws. N stands for nurturing peace and cooperation within ourselves and with all evolving beings, giving happiness to others through manashni, gavashni and kunashni, good thoughts, good words and good deeds. And how does the Zoroastrian College help to promote the sustainable development goals and support the work of the United Nations through the several departments, the Department of Avastha and Cosmic Ancient Wisdom and Scriptural Studies, for which we have many books, which we have published in the last many years, since the year 1977 onwards. Here is a book on the holy fire temples, not only in India, but throughout the world. The book on Archangel Gabriel, Ashur Sarushyazad, as is known in Avastan language. The book on Sudre, Light and Sound, how light and sound vibrations are the vibrationary frequencies through which the universe is created. Colors of Light. The Rainbow Colors of Light was released at a conference in Copenhagen in 1985, and it shows how all the different systems of healthcare in the world are complementary to each other, and every person can have his particular ailment diagnosed correctly and given treatment by proper methods. We have the Department of Ecology and Environmental Studies when the great Russian scientist, Professor Dr. Viktor Inushin of Kazakhstan came to India in 1998 and 1999 and established in the rural area, village well of our college grounds, the equipment for purification of water, where anaerobic bacteria cease to exist, where health and oxygen level goes up, and the health level of people in rural areas in every country of the world can be improved to the great advantage of the financial resources of the governments who need not provide for after illness treatment and hospitals when preventive healthcare measures are taken. There's the Department of Vastu and Vedic Ancient Wisdom and Vedic Ancient Indian Studies, the Department of Research for Universal Benefit of Humanity in all fields. And through these various departments, the Western College, which is open to all fit persons in all countries, without distinction of sex, nationality, gender, age, color or creed, it is a spiritual mother center a white light center for spreading the ancient cosmic wisdom and for development of other centers throughout the world. And it promotes the sustainable development goals of the United Nations Economic and Social Council for promoting peace on planet Earth through all these different departments for these different methods with a staff of more terrestrial college building in our library this is our building, and we give thanks to the late Dr. Ajit Singh Ji Kasliwal for helping the construction of this building, and all the other great donors, including the Mehrban Zathushti and the Zathushti brothers, and so many others who have lent their helping hand. We have here one of the pillars of the Zoroastrian College, late Bhiram Shah Pithawala, whose magnificent book, in search of divine light is a source of inspiration worldwide. With these words, I will conclude my speech and give blessings to all. Dr. Pooja Agrawal works for the IT industry and is a certified Scrum Master, ISTQB certified QA specialist with more than 14 years of experience in quality assurance, benchmarking and project deliveries. 
She has worked on diverse projects and teams across multiple geographies. Pooja holds a PGPM qualification from Sunstone Business School and works on project solutioning, benchmarking strategies, and innovation. She also completed her PhD in Conscious Architecture and Vastu Science for her new age reality and is actively advocating this ancient wisdom laid herein. She is also an Indology enthusiast and dives into research and advocacy for ancient Indian knowledge systems. Pooja is also a qualified clinical hypnotherapist and works for the cause of mental health and hygiene. Role of language and technology in women empowerment and gender equality. Language and technology are inherently intertwined. All technological feats would have required language to bring them into existence. So wherever we require technology, you also find language. The relationship between language and technology is therefore inevitable. Language technology is a science in itself and can enable humans to interact with robots with the help of an interface like a computer that commands them in machine language. In fact, today language models are being used to assess the quality of human translations. No one had thought earlier that language models could be put to such a use. Language is thus paramount for bringing in a positive change in society and contributing to literacy numbers. Average female literacy rate throughout the world is 79.9%, while for men it is 89.2%. India still lingers behind at 62% for women as compared to 80% for men. Financial independence is the main reason for working for 33% of the women surveyed. Other top reasons included supporting their family which accounted for 26%, Boosting their self-confidence, this accounted for 21.6% and keeping oneself busy, which is 6.7%. Many women who are unable to access quality educational opportunities struggle to receive the employment necessary to support themselves. Education is viewed as the most important factor in determining the quality of employment opportunities for women in India. India has one of the lowest female labor force participation rates in the world. As of 2019, only a reported 21% of women in India over the age of 15 participated in the labor force. The female to male workforce participation ratio in India, which is calculated by dividing the female labor force participation rate by the male labor force participation rate and multiplying by 100, comes out to be 276 This is far lower than the world average, which is 63.5. So educational disparities among women often lead to poorer health for them and their children. Literacy itself not only measures the ability of an individual to read and write, but health literacy is a specified form of literacy that measures an individual's ability to obtain and understand basic information about health and subsequently make informed decisions regarding healthcare. Companies like Tata Consultancy Services, Infosys, Wipro, Tech Mahindra, Emphasis, and Mindtree. They have at least three women and 10 employees. Most of them are chasing a target of 45 to 50% for female labor force in their total headcount in the coming quarters, with several initiatives lined up like increased campus and lateral hiring, building leadership pipelines, and skilling focused on women. Industries such as textiles and tobacco have historically hired women to work in manufacturing across the country. In recent years, they have been joined by companies in a range of different sectors. This trend is rapidly changing these days and it's a very, very positive thing to witness in STG 2030 journey. Women in localization is a beautiful global community for the advancement of women in localization industry. It aims to provide an open collaborative platform where women can share expertise, experience, and help each other move forward in their careers. Started in San Francisco Bay Area, Women in Localization has expanded its membership to include women across the globe, encouraging members to meet in other local geographies. So being a part of Women in Localization India chapter, I can vouch for the fabulous work this community is doing in the empowerment space and linking it with localization and technology. Even Cargo is a social enterprise that employs women from resource-poor communities 
and trains them for employment opportunities with the major e-commerce companies. To provide equal opportunities to girls in defense, the Samvit Gurukulam Girls Senate School, India's first female-only military academy, was inaugurated in Uttar Pradesh, Vrindavan City. Another big milestone. So globalization is at the root of important economic and social adjustments and a far-reaching impact in domestic production, labor markets, in almost all the countries, as well as on the distribution of income, energy consumption, usage of natural resources, travel, culture, IT, and communications. So global imbalances continue to create an unleveled playing ground for some countries and actors in the global system, fostering inequality between and within countries. To tackle the shortcomings of global system, one important step embodied in the 2030 agenda can be to enhance representation and voice for developing countries in decision making in global economic and financial institutions, thus ensuring more effective, credible, accountable and legitimate institutions. Thank you. Dr. Rusha Ajay Nair, a healthcare reformer and social activist, is from Mumbai in India. With a PhD in hospital and healthcare by research and an honorary doctor of science from the Kundalini Research Yoga Institute, she stands as a pioneer, authoring India's first book on the science of nutrigenomics. As a registered craniosacral therapist, disease reversal expert, and health and life transformation coach, she's a benchmark in her field. As a registered acupuncture therapy practitioner, she actively contributes towards the advancement of therapy through the Maharashtra Acupressure Council's Executive Committee. Dr. Nair's passion for holistic health and well-being now manifests in her focus on promoting yoga fitness, particularly within corporate settings. Drawing on three decades of healthcare experience, she founded Medex Metier Healthcare aiming to make a positive impact on individuals globally, one person at a time. Today, she brings her wealth of knowledge to us speaking on the review topic of the agreed conclusions of the 68th session. Let's hear from Dr. Usha Nair now. Greetings, my dear friends. I'm Dr. Usha Nair from Mumbai, India. Thank you, Ms. Karishma Koka, for the humble introduction. At the outset, let me also thank the NGO CSW Forum for giving us All India Shah Berambagh Society the opportunity and trusting on me to be able to share my views to the world on this international platform. My deepest gratitude to Dr. Meher Master Moors, the founder, president, and the board of all of the All India Shah Berambagh Society, our NGO, in special consultative status with the UN ECOSOC. I am also honored to be able to share my views at this forum a third time in a row on various topics from healthcare to women empowerment to innovation and technological change and education in the digital age, all for achieving gender equality and for the empowerment of all women and girls. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and fellow advocates for gender equality, I stand before you today to delve into a critical examination of social protection systems, access to public services and sustainable infrastructure in the context of advancing gender equality and empowering women and girls based on the agreed conclusions of the 63rd session. Let's look with an international perspective. As we navigate this complex landscape, it is essential to recognize the multifaceted nature of the challenges faced by women and girls globally. Let us begin by exploring social protection systems which play a pivotal role in safeguarding vulnerable populations. In countries like Sweden and Norway, robust social security safety nets provide comprehensive support ensuring that women have access to healthcare, education, and financial assistance, thereby fostering empowerment. Turning our attention to access to public services, Rwanda stands out as a beacon of progress. The country has successfully implemented policies that enhance women's participation in decision-making processes, exemplified by the significant representation 
of women in the Rwandan parliament. This showcases the transformative impact of inclusive public services on gender equality. Sustainable infrastructure is a linchpin in creating an environment conducive to gender empowerment. The examples of Bangladesh's Grand Mean Bank demonstrates how sustainable microfinance initiatives can uplift women from poverty, enabling entrepreneurship and financial independence. By investing in infrastructure that supports economic activities for women, we create a foundation for lasting change. However, it is crucial to acknowledge the existing challenges in many regions, women still face barriers to accessing quality education, healthcare, and empowerment opportunities. To overcome these hurdles, we must advocate for targeted policies and initiatives that address the specific needs of women and girls, ensuring their full integration into all aspects of society. Let's look at the India perspective. In the rich tapestry of global efforts towards gender equality, it's crucial to incorporate an Indian perspective where progress and challenges coexist within the vast and diverse landscape. India has made significant strides in recent years towards empowering women through social protection systems. Initiatives like the Pradhan Mantri Matru Vandana Yojana, a maternity benefit program aimed to ensure financial support for pregnant and lactating women and mothers. While these steps are commendable, there's a need to continued efforts to strengthen and expand such systems to reach every corner of the country. When examining access to public services, India's Beti Bachao, Beti Padhao campaign emphasizes the importance of education for girls. However, persistent issues like gender-based violence and societal norms still hinder girls' access to education in certain regions. Efforts to address these challenges must be intensified to ensure that all girls have equal opportunities to learn and thrive. Sustainable infrastructure projects such as Pradhan Mantri Avas Yojana, which focuses on providing housing for all, also plays a pivotal role in India's gender empowerment journey. However, there's room for improvement in ensuring that these infrastructural developments consider and address the unique needs of women, creating spaces where they can work, live, and participate in community life without hindrance or fear. Yet, challenges persist, and it's imperative to address them head on. Issues like gender-based violence, unequal access to resources and cultural norms that perpetuate gender stereotypes demand our collective attention. The implementation of effective policies along with community-driven initiatives is crucial to breaking down on these barriers. On the healthcare perspective, my specialty, in the realm of gender equality and empowerment in India, the healthcare perspective adds another layer to our understanding. While strides have been made, challenges persist, particularly in ensuring equitable access to healthcare services, especially for women and girls. India has witnessed commendable efforts such as Pradhan Mantri Surakshit Matritva Abhiyan aimed at providing comprehensive antenatal care to pregnant women. However, regional disparities and limited healthcare infrastructure in some areas hinder the universal reach of these programs. Strengthening healthcare infrastructure, especially in rural and under underserved regions, is crucial for ensuring that women receive timely and quality medical care. Maternal mortality rates have seen improvement, but the battle is not over. Encouragingly, states like Kerala, with their focus on female education and healthcare, show a positive correlation between women's well being and overall health indicators. Emphasizing similar approaches nationwide can contribute significantly to the health empowerment of women. In the context of access to family planning and reproductive health services, India's initiatives like the Janani Suraksha Yojana have played a pivotal role. However, challenges like cultural norms again and awareness gaps persist, impacting women's ability to make informed decisions and their reproductive health about especially their reproductive health, comprehensive education, 
and awareness campaigns are essential to bridge these gaps and empower women with knowledge and agency over their health. Yet, we must address the persistent issue of gender-biased violence impacting women's health. The One Stop Center and Solution Pradhan Mantri Matru Vandana Yojana are steps in the right direction, but concerted efforts are needed to create a healthcare environment where women feel safe, seeking assistance and reporting incidents of violence. In conclusion on healthcare, as we explore the healthcare perspective in the context of gender equality and empowerment in India, it's clear that progress has been made, but challenges persist. Strengthening healthcare infrastructure, promoting education and awareness, and addressing gender-based violence are crucial steps. By integrating these aspects in our broader discussions, we contribute to a more holistic understanding and approach to empowering women in the Indian healthcare landscape. We discussed global efforts towards gender equality. It is vital to recognize both the progress and the challenges within the Indian context by weaving together insights from successful initiatives and acknowledging areas that require more attention, we can contribute to a more inclusive and empowered future for women and girls, not just in India, but all around the world. As we reflect on the agreed conclusions of the 63rd session, it is evident that progress has been made, but there is much work left to be done. We must prioritize the dismantling of systemic barriers, including gender-based violence, discriminatory laws, and cultural norms that perpetuate gender inequality. Finally, concluding our collective commitment to reshaping social protection systems, enhancing access to public services, and investing in sustainable infrastructure is paramount. By learning from successful examples around the world, we can create a blueprint for a more equitable future. Let us seize this opportunity to drive change, empower women and girls, and build a world where gender equality it is not just a goal, but a reality for all. Dr. Usha Nair, signing off from India. Thank you. Dr. Janvi Mahadik is the director at Astro Booster Private Limited Company and a Vastu Shastra trainer in Vastu Spandam. Currently, she is the Associate Training Center Head and Guide of the Pune Center of Shah Behram Shah Bagh Society, Zoroastrian College. Dr. Janvi completed her PhD in Vedic Vastu Shastra and the Master's degree in Vedang Jyotish. She has over 15 years of experience in the field of astrology and Vastu Shastra. She is the writer of Vastu Vidya book, which is available in three languages along with the audiobook format. Dr. Janvi likes to research on a remedial part in Vedic Vastu Shastra and other occult sciences. Her speech topic, Empowering Women and Girls Through Ancient Indian Vedic Sciences, may involve providing them with tools for self-discovery, inner strength, and spiritual growth. Yatra Nayas tu pujante, Ramante Tatra Devataha means where women are honored, divinity blossoms there. Jai Gurudev Namaskar Namo Namaha. This is Dr. Janavi, Janavi Mahadik from Bharat, scholar of ancient Indian wisdom. Honorable ma'am, Professor Dr. Meher Master Mus, members of the panels, invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. This is great pleasure and deep moment of pride and honor to represent organization Shah Bahram Bagh Society in this forum of CSW68 and share my views on empowering women and girls through ancient Indian wisdom. See, when women have equal opportunities in education, employment, leadership, it positively impacts economic and social development of country. That is, the growth of country is directly linked to the active participation and empowerment of women. And that's why in Indian Veda, women are called architect, architect of society. Nari asya samajasya kushala vastu karasti. If so, 
then empowering women and girls is the first priority of each and every country. This can be achieved by many ways. Let's discuss one of them that is by using ancient Indian wisdom. Empowering women through ancient Indian wisdom like Veda, Yoga, Ayurveda, Indian architecture science that is Vastu Shastra. Starting with philosophical tradition that is Veda. How Veda contributes to empowerment of women? Let's see. Veda teaches us spiritual equality. Inheritance spiritual equality of all beings regardless of gender. This principle promotes a sense of worth and purpose, fostering empowerment for women. Secondly, Veda teaches a self-realization. Vedanta encourages realization of one's true nature. Now, next is very important, detachment and resilience. Vedantic techniques on detachment from the material world and the acceptance of life's challenges contribute to emotional resilience. Women can navigate difficulties with a balanced and composed mindset when she learn this detachment and resilience using the Veda technique. Knowledge and Wisdom Vedanta values knowledge and wisdom. Women can empower themselves through education and the pursuit of wisdom, gaining the confidence to contribute meaningfully to their communities. Thus, thus by integrating Vedantic principle into their lives, women can find empowerment through spiritual understanding, self-realization and sense of purpose aligned with broader principles of dharma and universal interconnectedness. Like Vedanta, next key component of ancient Indian wisdom is Ayurveda. Ayurveda contributes to the empowerment of women by addressing holistic well-being and emphasizing balance in physical, mental and spiritual aspects. Ayurveda provides personalized health guidance based on individual constitution that is doshas. This approach helps women maintain physical balance addressing specific health needs. Empowered women can navigate challenges with a calm and focused mind when she learns meditation and yoga. Ayurveda emphasizes mindful eating based on one's constitution. Proper nutrition supports women's health, providing energy and vitality crucial for empowerment. Ayurvedic remedies often involve natural herbs and therapies. Minimizing relies on synthetic substances. This approach aligns with empowering women to take charge of their health in more sustainable manner. In this way, by integrating Ayurvedic principles into daily life, women can nurture their physical and mental well-being, promoting a sense of empowerment and self-awareness. Our next tool is very important and powerful tool for empowerment, that is yoga. Yoga contributes to the empowerment of women by fostering physical, mental and emotional well-being. Regular yoga practice enhances physical strength and flexibility, promoting a sense of confidence and empowerment in one's body. Yoga incorporates mindful breathing and relaxation techniques, aiding in stress management. Empowered women can handle challenges more effectively with a calm and centered mind if she learn such relaxation techniques from the yoga. Yoga also encourages awareness of the mind-body connection, promoting self-reflection and a deeper understanding of oneself. This self-awareness is crucial for empowerment. Yoga provides tools to navigate emotions and cultivate emotional resilience. Women can develop a balanced and a stable emotional state contributing to empowerment in various aspects of life 
by using this yoga techniques vedanta ayurveda yoga and after that comes an ancient indian architecture science that is vastu shastra this science contributes to the empowerment of women by creating harmonious living spaces that positively influence well-being and personal growth vastu emphasizes creating balanced and harmonious living spaces empowered women can benefit from surroundings that promote a sense of peace balance and a positive energy contributing to overall well-being vastu principles guide the arrangement of spaces to allow for the free flow positive energy this can impact the mental and emotional state of individuals helping women feel more energized and focused vastu principles can be applied to work spaces vastu shastra provides a guidance on designing personal spaces like bedrooms a well aligned harmonious bedroom can contribute to restful sleep and emotional well being empowering women to face daily challenges vastu considers the position of various rooms in relation to each other this can contribute to family harmony and positive relationship fostering a supportive environment for women and pursue their goals vastu aims to attract positive energies that support prosperity empowered women can benefit from living in spaces that encourages abundance both in terms of material well-being and personal growth so by applying vastu principles to living and working spaces women can create environments that align with their goals promote well-being and contribute to a sense of empowerment in various aspect of their lives means in short the ancient indian wisdom includes ayurveda system of medicine that emphasizes holistic well-being and balance yoga a system of physical mental and spiritual practices aimed at achieving harmony and self realization vastu shastra architectural principles guiding the design and layout of spaces for harmony and positive energy means in current era we can easily apply all this technique for the empowerment of women why why we want to give priority to this subject that is empowering women because nari shakti shaktishali samajasya nirmanam karoti nari shakti shaktishali samajasya nirmanam karoti means women empowerment can make the society powerful nation powerful and ultimately the whole world thank you so much abhar jay tu shastra jay tu bhar Dr. Bindu Kapil Bendre is a PhD in sound healing, master of science, founder of Anantyam. She is a researcher in alternative medicine and healing, a sound therapist trainer, guide, and management of community living project. Over to Dr. Bindu Kapil Bendre. Hello and namaste to all my friends here. I am Dr. Bindu and I have done my PhD in sound healing. I am also along with being a sound therapist, I am a trainer in Siddhi Samadhi Yoga the organization where I work with. I am into management of a community living project of the same trust and do rural development where women empowerment is a part of it. we have adopted 12 villages and i work for the women empowerment of those women there i have done my phd in sound healing as i mentioned i have done my masters in chemistry and lot of other energy modality programs that i have done the grace and the blessings of masters is what sparked my fuel my topic today is the sound of a woman 
who listens to a woman yeah have you ever heard a woman yes why am i saying that because when we have to work for women for the betterment of women and girls we need to first and foremost empathetically listen to them listening will happen only when they are able to speak up when they are able to share so creating a platform where there is empathetic listening and inspiring them to speak up to share to stand up for themselves this all is possible through the frequencies of sound yes creating an ambience where there is sound and uh, opening up of heart expressions deeper emotions can come out when we empathetically hear and this expressions ha- happen that's where we can work on then we can also have some sonic stories of empowerment through sound and creating an ambience of sound meditation going to a deeper state of theta state and then coming up with and sharing stories of great people who have great women who have achieved a lot in terms of outwardly words inner growth and everything when this sonic stories are present to presented a deeper impact happens and they are ready to jump and take and rise to high heights in their own lives sound meditation is also used for self empowerment so a guided meditation with affirmations of what i wish to be removing of fear and putting in the affirmation through sound going to a deeper state where happy chemicals are released and that is the time when the affirmations are very impactful so that is what we are intending to do so my whole purpose is giving a sound to women where they can express themselves they can have their own voice empowering them raising them rising them about the poverty and the gender bias thing so sound healing helps us in various ways as i said affirmations is one of the ways sound meditation along with visualizations so going to a deep state through sound and nada energy and visualizing it when we visualize we can manifest we can create we can attract so empowering the girls at a very young age already i'm doing it for many girls across india uh, we have also worked for village level rural girls and young girls in cities also where they are empowered with the power of visualization after going to a deep state of uh, meditation sound meditation so this empowering this manifestation can help them create their own life be responsible take charge of their life chanting for collective strength if all this women when we create a platform where they can come together all the girls all the women and they chant together chanting for the empowerment there are various chants and mantras which using this our throat as the sound instrument when chanting is done collectively as a group it has a great impact and it can move the world move the women take them to a higher higher purpose take them to a higher empowerment state than what they are they can bring about that power in them that change in them and by doing this group chanting we bring about a fostering of a sense of solidarity where we create a platform where all of them come together and united they stand for each other and the power of the group energy the power of togetherness is experienced along with the sound energy and then fusing with yoga when there are body movements and there is a balance there is a rhythm of sound mixed with it then yoga and sound fusion can bring miraculous health wise body wise also they can create that body as temple they can have have a sound mental health great emotional health and a great physique when all these things are in place going ahead in life manifesting attracting living up their goals becomes very very easy so a combination of yoga and sound is also promoted rhythmic empowerment through sound circles so there can be circles where they can meet up together they can have certain sound chantings mantras sound instruments and 
certain frequencies which can be played together to bring about this change, this revolution. Where interactive sound workshops can happen, where they can learn, they can teach each other, they can learn, they can share a platform where they ex share the experiences of differences, how they have brought about change through sound energy in people's life around, in the woman life around and everyone around. They can heal their self, they can heal everyone around them. So that is the power of sound and the collective sound energy. So empowering them with such interactive sound workshops, making them learn sound healing, making them practice it, share it with the world and practice it to the extent to heal self, to heal others. Then financially, of course, when they practice, they heal others, they work for the community, for the circle, for everyone, money is by default going to flow. Financial abundance will automatically come to them because all these are valued by the world. These are the services, this is beautiful experiences that people have, deep relaxation, deep tissue muscle, total stress removal, de-stressing, in fact, going to a higher state, higher vibration, higher frequencies, adding prana, chakra cleansing, all these things can happen, going from this E state to E state. So when all these things we are able to contribute to the world, finance will easily flow in, in every woman's life, every girl's life. So this is what I envision and I see it happening. Sustainable practices like soundscape, we can have various sound rooms, sound gardens, sound communities, online, offline, in the hospitals, in the schools for brain activation of children. I recently did a brain activation program for about 800 girls is a project where we run the first pilot project for 50 girls and a huge transformation is seen in them. They are guided by their intuition, they are connected to their sixth sense and what energy, being relaxed, peace, at calm and being that powerhouse to manifest, to live their dreams and to have a focus, a memory and intuition guided life. Would you like to be one of them? That is the question. We can be one and we can take people along. That is the power of beautiful Nad energies. Yeah. So let's not just make noise. Let's make this sound help the world and create a, a world beautiful for women, for girls to rise above poverty, to have everything what they need, their aspire dream possible and to rise above the gender. May there not be any differences. May they just all be one. Oneness is my motto. Seeing divinity in everybody is my motto, my Maha Mantra. Thank you and very, very much gratitude to all those people who have made this possible for me to express and share my views at this platform to to the university where I'm connected with, to this platform of UN, to this year's event. Thank you very much. Love you all. Thank you. Dr. Koka Karishma did her PhD in neuroscience, learning and development at the University of Cambridge and her postdoctoral research with the Media Research Council. With her mother, she co-founded the Ultimate Achievements Academy for higher education, encouraged by her father, focusing on holistic education for excellence and empowerment. Karishma is the Zoroastrian representative and honorary secretary for the Barnet Multi-Faith Forum and represents the Zoroastrian Trust Funds of Europe, where she is committee member as the honorary communications officer. She is the UK coordinator for the Zoroastrian Education Network of the WZCC. With her mother, Jeru, she has spoken at several forums and represented the Zoroastrian faith at the United Nations meeting in London. Karishma has been elected to the Religions of Peace Women's Steering Committee. Mrs. Jeru Pantaki Ram Mohan. Jeru is alternative medical practitioner, researcher, educator, entrepreneur, life coach, beauty therapist, athlete, an environmental health and life coach. She has won many awards in different disciplines. A graduate 
in nursing. She has served the poorest of poor to the richest honorarily for the good of health and holistic development. As learning and development mentor and co-founder Ultimate Achievements Academy, Jairu catalyzes the growth and learning of individuals. Jairu taught the Duke of Edinburgh award classes in high school, has been a life and general insurance agent, inspector and enjoys art, music and nature painting. Jeru hails from a high priestly Zoroastrian Parsi family with religion and spirituality at heart and respects all faith alike. Having been married for nearly half a century to a highly qualified late commander Koka Ram Mohan who served the Indian Navy, Jeru has been widowed for the last 4 years. They are role models for education and continued learning, having encouraged their own daughter and other children to strive for excellence and happiness jeru has established her academy for higher education along with her daughter dr koka karishma neuroscientist having successfully produced doctors engineers and graduates in various disciplines along with successful students in different vocations over 85 years she has dedicated 65 years to service to children and a cross section of adults including parents teachers and senior citizens namaste thank you for being with us as an extension of ourselves today as we offer this idea of holistic education towards empowerment of all children irrespective of gender with social cultural environmental and economic values being the method through which The 68th session of the Commission on the Status of Women may consider achieving their goals effectively by focusing on the fourth sustainable development goal of the United Nations, namely quality education. I'm a very fortunate daughter, and I've got my mother here with me, Mrs. Jaru Panthiki Ram Mohan, who has decades of experience in holistic education. and i've been supported by my late father commander koka ram mohan throughout my life so let me ask you mummy what in your thoughts is holistic education well you know what holistic education is karishma because you have received it from your age of 2 you have learned everything from home science to arts and crafts to your academic education and all the other uh, uh, hobbies that you have learned plus all the teaching you have done right up to university and various faculties true you have had a complete education all round including spirituality and meditation it's an all round based holistic honest clean education it helps advancement progress and prosperity of all individuals it involves giving some knowledge of all the academic subjects social scientific arts art economic and cultural value based education as also knowledge of street wise education you'll ask me what street wise education is it is what people ought to know which is never taught in schools and colleges mm. things like financial economic uh, banking uh, shopping comparing prices buying a house or building a house right and various other things like that which you should know which is never ever taught to you scholastically true another aspect of holistic education is love and respect for mother earth which involves the knowledge of caring for and preserving the entire environment which involves the knowledge of all aspects of life including 
food, water, air, energy, vegetation, and the entire ecosystem. It also includes relationships of all kinds, yes. as well as housekeeping, with respect for each other, young or old, cooking, cleaning, everything that includes housework. Mm -hmm. In a nutshell, holistic education is worldwide education, which includes mindfulness and spirituality as well. Covering all social, economic, and cultural values in order to develop resilience mm. and ability, adaptability with confidence and self esteem. It helps shared responsibility, exchanging roles and when, as and when required, appreciating different perspectives. For example, Filling the role of any par any one parent when the other parent is not available. Mm -hmm. Or filling a vacancy for a particular trade, business, vocation base on the individual's talent and skills. Mm -hmm. Therefore, opportunities need to be available for all individuals to learn whatever the, they choose to do or they would love to learn. For which funding needs to be provided for the needy. Thereby one can steer management of organizations towards sustainable progress and prosperity. By passing on on to others, the values, helping them to nurture and inspire others in turn to grow, in their turn to grow from generation to generation, we will succeed in creating sustainability, growth and prosperity. Sharing knowledge with those who need it makes each individual a beacon of light so that Every stage of life is lived happily with satisfaction, security, and peace. Thank you. Thank you, Mummy. We feel that holistic education helps the empowerment for all. It is important to us that this is offered irrespective of gender, age, religion. So a form of continued education that starts young and never ends. This is our perspective. It has helped me and helped several others build self-esteem and interdependence. Achieving the good of all, the world as a whole, while also helping the goals of the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women achieve success. Thank you for being with us and hope to join us in empowering others through this model. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Zoroastrian College and All India Shah Bayrambagh Society for Scientific and Educational Research, I extend heartfelt gratitude to each of you. I extend my sincerest gratitude to the organizers of the CSW 68 Forum and the United Nations for providing us with this invaluable platform to collaborate with like-minded individuals towards meaningful change. Thank you. Team Dr. Professor Meher Master Moose for your enduring dedication, visionary leadership, and untiring efforts over many decades. Special appreciation goes to Dr. Devish Chen, Chancellor Prestige University Indore, for his enlightening keynote address and to all the speakers for their outstanding presentations. Dr. Saili, Dr. Pooja, Dr. Usha Nair, Dr. Jahanvi, Dr. Bindu, Mrs. Jeru. Gratitude to Dr. Karishma Koka for her exceptional anchoring, Madam Khushid for her invaluable assistance, and Dr. Zubair Khan for his technical expertise in stage managing this program seamlessly. Last but not least, to our cherished audience, your presence and support 
have been instrumental in amplifying our message and spreading awareness. Thank you all. Namaskar. Dr. Zubair Khan is currently Head of Department of Mass Communication at Prestige Institute of Management and Research Indore. He has completed his PhD in Mass Communication and has completed a thesis on OTT censorship among India and six other countries. Prior to this, he has a nine years of media experience and academic experience. He has worked in various national regional news channels and news agencies such as NDTV, Khabar Bharti, SRMP, BTV News and ADS news agencies as a news producer, senior journalist, production head and editor. He has established his own regional news channel, Khabar Nation Madhya Pradesh and Khabar Nation, a weekly newspaper. His expertise are in filmmaking, digital photography, audio-video production, editing, radio production and print and electronic media.